Today we are diving into one of the most critical and often overlooked aspects of AI success, governance. As organizations race to integrate AI into their operations, the need for clear, responsible oversight has never been more urgent. Joining me today is Jesse McCroskey, Principal Architect for GenAI at Egen. Jesse brings deep insights into how effective governance isn't just about compliance. It's a strategic lever for innovation, risk management, and long-term value. In this episode, we will explore why governance is so fundamental to AI strategy. How does it shape fairness and transparency and what it really takes to balance innovation with ethical responsibility. So without further ado, let's go and talk to Jesse. Jesse, it's great to have you back on the show. Thanks for having me, Swapnil. It's a pleasure to be here. Why is AI governance so important to AI strategy? I think we're in an era, and I think some Forrester research I've read uh, backs this up, where businesses are starting to recognize that if they want to scale and innovate with AI, they need to get their own houses in order. And this means establishing robust uh, AI governance processes. I think we've seen and you know read in the headlines a lot of cases where these processes were not in place and things did not go well. And not just the dramatic cases of you know lawsuits and you know fines and that sort of thing, but also just cases where a large proportion of AI initiatives do not succeed and are not well aligned with business value. Because AI really is a special kind of beast. It really has unique risks that require robust uh, governance processes in order to ensure value. Um, I can tell you a, a brief example. So there's sort of a canonical story in the AI ethics community that maybe some of your viewers have heard of about how if you task a very intelligent AI with uh, making as many paper clips as possible, that maybe this AI is going to become too powerful and it's going to start turning everything, even us, into paper clips. And it's a sort of dystopian sci-fi story. So it's a little bit silly, but it also, I think, hints at one of the really important issues in AI governance, which is the idea of alignment and how AI becomes very good at doing what you tell it to do, not necessarily what you actually want it to do. So this idea is operationalized in uh, something called Goodhart's Law, which talks about how um, it's, it's kind of like uh, Murphy's Law for techies, in a sense, how things will go wrong. Um, to give an example, so if you talk about uh, cobras, so there was a story about how in India, I think at some point during the colonial era, the government decided there were too many cobras and they needed to do something about this. Uh, so they offered a bounty for people to bring in dead cobras and they thought this was going to solve their problem. Uh, so what we have here is a value that we want to achieve, which is less cobras. And at the same time, we have a metric that we're applying optimization pressure to, which is people killing cobras. And so you, you think this is going to work out. But what Goodhart's Law says is that because you're applying this optimization pressure, people are going to find a way to cheat. And that's exactly what they did. We ended up with the entrepreneuring people starting cobra breeding farms where they grew lots and lots of cobras that they could then kill and take in for bounties and it didn't solve the problem at all. So this sounds a little bit far from AI but the same sort of problem occurs in almost any kind of AI system and if you think about like content recommendation where video recommenders we want to show people videos that they're going to enjoy it's really hard to measure if people enjoy something so instead you just measure do they watch it do they click on it and you end up showing all this you know clickbait all this you know really extreme content and that sort of thing and we end up with these sorts of problems just all over the place. What are the key elements of AI governance? I like to think about AI governance in terms of risk. I think that you need to have a broad conception of what risk is, otherwise you end up with a very myopic uh, kind of picture. But if we think broadly about risk, and I, uh, when I give presentations, I have a slide about the kind of this framework of different sorts of risk. And we talk about regulatory risk, which is you know fairly obvious in a sense. We're in an era that AI regulation is very quickly being established and emerging, and it's tough for the, the lawyers to even to keep on top of it. But as well, we think about operational risk, which is where an AI system may not be aligned with business value, may in fact cause harm to the business. We can also think about the, the risk of missing out. If your competitors are using AI and you're not, and they're able to achieve efficiency gains, this is another sort of risk that needs to be considered. Then as well, as we get more into the responsible tech realm of things, we can think about um, reputational risk and then social or environmental risk. So reputational risk is where my business, for example, might have made commitments to its customers, to the public, to its contractors, to whoever, 
saying these are our values, these are the principles we're going to uphold, and if our deployment of AI is going to come into conflict with those, we face reputational risks. Similarly, if the company that I'm working for is doing something that's not good for the world somehow, then we have these societal and environmental risks. So once you have a broad enough conception of risk, it's really about risk assessment and risk mitigation. And I used to joke that all you really have to do is get a bunch of smart people in the room and have them think about what can go wrong and what to do about it. And when it comes down to it, you know, there's, a, there's some truth to that. But what AI governance does is systematizes and makes more robust these sorts of processes. So you have things like actually getting clear on how, as a business, we're going to operationalize our values and principles. We're clear on who is accountable for what part of the process. We're clear on you know, the data governance principles. That's a field that's been around a little longer, and we can learn from, from their lessons. How are we going to work through a model's life cycle and make sure that after something's deployed, we don't just stop paying attention to it. Uh, there's the documentation and transparency side of things, which is really important. And finally, focus on the people. And I think the kind of like, you know, upskilling and having the necessary expertise and creating the appropriate culture is so critical. AI governance very easily becomes a box ticking exercise. And without a culture of actually caring about getting this right, it's very difficult to, uh, to end up with good outcomes. Can you also talk about what is the scope? What is the role of AI governance when organizations are building their AI systems? So, I mean, governance in a general sense is about making sure things go the way you want them to go, to put it simply. And when an AI initiative is being designed, it should be designed for some purpose. There should be some sense of this is what we want the world to look like because this project succeeds. And so what I would say is AI governance is a process to ensure that that potential is going to be realized and also that we don't end up with unintended consequences like breaking the law or ending up with you know lawsuits or whatever else. Um, so what I would say is that with governance people most often think about compliance, they think about fines, they think about lawsuits and everything like that. But also it's very important to think about the business outcomes. Um, it's a little bit of an older example but still a very good one I think. Zillow had a AI system they used to estimate the, the values of properties and the potential for, uh, for flipping. So they had a kind of subsidiary business where they were buying and selling homes and turning a profit. And I certainly don't want to cast any shade on anyone there. This was very early in the kind of understanding of AI governance. But let, let's just say, for example, they probably didn't have an adequate governance process in place. And what ended up happening was their model was not actually robust enough to deal with changing market conditions. And they ended up with quite a disastrous uh, situation where they had a lot of houses they had to sell at a loss. I think I read they lost something like $500 million in just one year. They shut down that division. They laid off a quarter of their staff. So this is not about breaking the law. This is not about anyone getting angry at you and suing you. This is just an AI system that's, not, that's too risky, not being adequately managed and mitigated and ending up with very bad outcomes for the business. How does AI governance help prevent bias and ensure fairness in AI systems. Yeah, so bias and fairness, bias and fairness, sorry, is a uh, kind of a topic close to my home because I think a lot of people get it wrong. Um, and you can probably find a lot of people that want to sell you unbiased models and fair data or whatever else. And I would definitely be a little bit skeptical of those folks. Um, nothing is unbiased and nothing is fair when it comes to data, at least that comes from the real world. When we think statistically about data, we think about data generating processes. So the sorts of AI we're talking about today, the data generating process is the real world. It's people, it's society. And you know, like it or not, we do not live in a just society. There's you know, unfairness everywhere. And so the data that's generated by that process is also going to be unfair. And there is nothing you can do about that. To give a simple example, think about medical data. We can say that the data generating process is biased. Let's say we want to investigate the invest the uh, effectiveness of certain treatments for different people or whatever, I don't know. So there's going to be inequities in access to these treatments and certain sorts of people, usually poor people, are going to have less access to the treatments and so are going to cont contribute less to the data. And so that's one sort of bias. Then we can talk about the uh, kind of data collection process and maybe certain clinics have good computer systems and networks so we can get their data and others don't. And so we're going to end up having bias where we're collecting data mostly from clinics in richer areas or whatever that have better access to you know, the network equipment. Then we can talk about data curation and let's say the researchers are speaking English and they have trouble dealing with other languages so when they're curating data they're going to say maybe to make our lives easier we're only going to use the English data and so there's more bias. And then the model itself can increase the bias as well. 
So no matter what you do, you're going to have bias in your data. And I'll return to my point before about how AI governance is about risk assessment and risk mitigation. So we understand that our, our data and our models are biased. What are we going to do about it to ensure that we don't create harm in the real world? And if you'll forgive me one more brief anecdote, uh, there's a great story from uh, um, DALI, from OpenAI, if you're familiar with it. It's an AI model that allows you to generate images from prompts. So you can say, show me pictures of cats dancing. It'll make pictures of cats dancing or whatever. But they had problems with bias in the early days. And if you asked for pictures of lawyers, it would give you eight pictures of white guys. And if you asked for pictures of flight attendants, it would give you eight pictures of Asian women for whatever reason. Uh, so clearly there's a problem here. And what happened was OpenAI put out a, a blog post, like super brief, like one page on the screen saying, hey, we had this problem, we fixed it, don't worry, all good now. And it was true. If you asked for pictures of lawyers, some of them would be women, some of them would be different ethnicities, whatever else. But they said nothing about how they fixed the problem. And this is the really fascinating part. So somebody in the community, uh, some anonymous soul, came up with a great hypothesis and a way to test it. And what they did was they asked Dali to generate pictures of a person holding a sign saying. And that was all they asked for. What they got was pictures of people holding signs. And some of those signs said women. And some of those signs said black. And some of those signs said whatever else. And so what they realized was that all OpenAI was doing was saying, hey, if this is a prompt that has something to do with showing people where bias might be an issue, just randomly append the name of some, some underrepresented group to the end of the prompt. And like the community just ripped into OpenAI about this. It was really funny, actually. A lot of you know good witticisms on Twitter, as it was called back in the day. Um, and uh, yeah, so OpenAI, you know, didn't really respond to that anyway. But the point is that I'm actually not as hard on OpenAI as the rest of the community in this case, because I think what they did was at least pointing in the right direction. The point is that I don't think you can tell me, if you have eight pictures of lawyers, how many of them should be women, how many of them should be men, how many of them should be you know, white or black or whatever else. You know, there's no right answer to that question. Should it represent you know, the human population or the population of lawyers? Or should there be you know, more women to counteract past injustices? Or you, know, you can debate this stuff forever. There's no easy answer there. And there's no such thing as an unbiased model in this case. So what OpenAI did was they did a risk assessment. They saw, hey, we're showing very non-representational pictures here. This could end up in some campus brochure and people are going to think like, hey, only white guys can be lawyers or whatever. This is like a harm that we see a risk of. So what can we do to mitigate this risk? And they came up with a, a very simple solution to that. So I'm not saying that what OpenAI did was like the final perfect answer, but I would say that they were kind of following the right blueprint in the sense of AI governance and that you know this, this kind of work is continuing and of course Google got into a lot of trouble over that kind of thing later. There's still a lot of work and refinements to happen. But it shows the right kind of thinking and how you actually deal with bias. How do you balance innovation with the need for responsible AI governance? Yeah, good question. And what I would argue is that it's not something that needs to be balanced. I think uh, AI governance can support innovation. The way to see this is really design thinking, where we think when we want to build a system, we want to think about how we want to design it. We want to understand how are we going to measure success. We want to envision the world that we want to create by building this system. And so when we have this sort of thinking, then we can understand how design processes and governance processes can kind of come together. So the, the one place that I think balance is needed is that there's this idea of sandboxes where earlier on developers, AI architects, whoever else, kind of should be free to experiment and to play and to try different things without worrying about going through a lot of you know, documentation or whatever else. And I think this is important to support, but at the same time, AI governance is something that has to be a part of the entire AI life cycle. It's not something you can tack on at the end. So I think the real balancing act is how do you create processes that support people in early stages of innovation to better understand what they're trying to accomplish and better understand how they're going to measure success. And when you have a process that can support that, then you have a process that will support innovation. How do you ensure AI systems are aligned with ethical principles and societal values? And also these values, they change depending on the region. How do you ensure that? Great question, Swapnil. And there's a lot of philosophical implications there that we could you know, get to in five or six hours over a couple of beers, but I'll give you the, the brief answer. I think the first part is it's important for a business to clarify its own ethical principles and values. 
and those should be kind of respected above all. At the same time, it is important, you know, businesses often work in very international global contexts, and it's important to understand the cultural norms that you're working in. in. So it may be necessary to have different variations of a product for different audiences, and that's, you know, another aspect of governance. But what I'll say for now is that once you've clarified what values and principles are important to you, it really is a continuous process. It's something where you have to engage from the very beginning of the design phase through execution, through deployment, through monitoring, all the way through. Um, I think one important part of this is engaging with stakeholders that are representative of the sorts of people that are going to be impacted by your products. So this can mean having diverse teams, so you understand you know, the different perspectives internally. But also it can mean you know, external stakeholder uh, co um, conversations. So this doesn't have to be anything really heavy lift. It can be as simple as you know, ordinary UX research, where you're going to be talking to different sorts of customers that might be using your products and making sure you understand their perspectives as well. The other thing I would say, and this is a little bit off topic, but I think is important enough to include, that transparency is often trumpeted as one of the important aspects of AI governance, and that's for a very good reason. I think that AI does have the potential to change our world and our society and our economy, and I would say that everybody has the right to be involved in conversations about what sort of world we're building. So if we want everybody to be able to participate in that conversation, we need to make sure everybody has some idea of what's being built and how it's being designed and why it's being designed in the way that it is. And that's why I think transparency is so important to give people the information they need to be active participants in conversations about what sort of world we're going to build. So of course businesses have you know, secrets, businesses have confidential data, we don't have to you know, give away the whole farm, but it is important that at a high level, at a design perspective, we are honest and upfront with the public about what we're building and why we're building it. Jesse, thank you so much for joining me today and talk about this important topic that is often overlooked. Thanks for great insights and I look forward to having this discussion with you again. Thank you. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you for having me.